and I appreciate her um, assisting me with the presentation today. So we're going to do LPS Conservatorship 101. This will be a lot of information. I will uh, be going over a lot of process, how things occur in LA County. This is LA County specific. And while conservatorship, uh, the laws of conservatorship are the uh, same in all every county in the state, um, each public guardian office may operate slightly different. Your um, mental health court may operate slightly different. So this information is generally specific to LA County. Next slide, please. So we're gonna do an overview of the Office of the Public Guardian. We'll talk about conservatorship, uh, the intent, the purpose and types that we deal with. And I'll talk about conservatorship services that are available in LA County, talking about how a referral can come in through an inpatient process, what we call the traditional process, our new outpatient pilots, and then talk a little bit about Public Guardian as conservator. Next slide. So first of all, very important to understand is that the public guardian is the designated county conservatorship investigator for all LPS conservatorships. So one of the, the first questions we get from families, and I think uh, NAMI does too, is can I, can as a loved one, as a parent, a spouse of someone who's suffering from mental health disorders, can you walk into the mental health court and file for the LPS conservatorship? You cannot. Um, the law has been set up that every county will have a county conservatorship investigator. Generally, that's the public guardian's office. It can be called the public conservator's office. And in rare circumstances, it might be the behavioral health uh, program that's doing that initial investigation. But in LA County, it is the public guardian. So all referrals for LPS must come to the public guardian's office. And we are the only entity that can initiate the first petition in the court, and we're the only entity that can investigate whether or not your loved one should be conserved or not. We get referrals. Um, referrals come into our office in a number of ways. I'll talk about that in a, in a, in a moment. Uh, but we can accept or reject the referral. So, um, And there's a couple of reasons why we may reject a referral. One of the biggest reasons is that your loved one is not a county resident. Uh, LA County um, sees this, um, not a lot, but we do, this is probably our number one reason why we will reject a referral that comes from a hospital. Uh, your, you, if you live in, let's say you live on the borders of LA County, uh, but you're in Ventura County or in Orange County or Riverside County, but your loved one gets hospitalized in LA County. LA County Hospital tries to send the referral to the public guardian's office in LA County, we will reject that referral. The hospital needs to refer that case to the county of residence of where your loved one lives. Um, similarly, if your loved one is a veteran and happens to get hospitalized in one of the two uh, VA hospitals in LA County, we will not accept that referral if they are um, if your loved one is from a, a, a neighboring county. So we will reject due to county residency. We'll reject if the referral just lacks the evidence or information about grade disability, um, if the referral is incomplete, or if the referral is not legible. Um, and this is um, often common with our physicians. They need to make sure to, to send us something that we can actually read and that the court can read because the court will reject the, the petition if they cannot refute, uh, actually read the documents. Next slide, please. So what is conservatorship? So you've heard this, um, you've heard about um, the criteria for establishing it, but it's a court proceeding that will appoint a legally responsible per person for someone who's unable to manage for their personal needs and potentially unable to manage for their finances or their estate. There are three types of conservatorships in California, LPS, which will be the focus of this training, the probate, which Gail has already um, told you a little bit about, but this is generally for older adults with major neurocognitive disorders or who are developmentally disabled. I want to add on to what Gail said. Um, I think a lot of families who have who struggle to get the LPS conservatorship will look to the probate, hoping that that is something that that they can do to get. Um, some power and control for their loved one. 
anyone can petition for a probate conservatorship. There isn't the same process where you have to go through the public guardian's office to get a probate. But I really want to caution you. The probate conservatorship does not get you what you want if your loved one is suffering from a mental health disorder. A probate conservatorship does not allow you to authorize to place your loved one in a locked psychiatric facility. It does not allow you to authorize involuntary medications for the psychiatric condition. So if you're getting that conservatorship, it's really not what you're looking for and it does not get you the authority to do so. And unless you do it yourself, you could be paying thousands and thousands of dollars um, for an attorney to help you get that conservatorship. So I just want to caution you that the probate is really for someone who has had, who has dementia, who's had a stroke, maybe a traumatic brain injury or developmentally disabled. And then there is a third type of conservatorship that is technically on the books in the state of California. This is called the housing conservatorship. This is a pilot conservatorship that was only made available in three counties. Um, the only county that is currently um, has this available to them is San Francisco County. So um, that is not, um, a, again, not a conservatorship we're gonna talk about here. Next slide. So it's a civil proceeding requiring proof of need and attendance. So this means that we have to prove the case um, that the person does in fact need the conservatorship and the conservatee or proposed conservatee will have to attend court unless they choose not to attend court and they, and they inform their attorney that they don't wanna attend court. But um, that's going to be very important later on, especially when we talk about our, our outpatient pilots around this idea that you have to get the proposed conservatorship to court and they have a right to be at court. Uh, so keep that in mind. Next slide. So here's just a few pieces of information that come strictly out of the law. When the LPS Act was created, um, the legislature indicated it had a few intentions and purposes that they wanted with this mental health law. And the LPS Act covers a lot of mental health law. Um, one of which is the conservatorship process. So here's a few things that's important around the law. Um, the legislator wanted to end inappropriate and indefinite involuntary commitment. If we think about when the LPS Act was created, it was the late 1960s. And unfortunately, back in the day, there was a lot of inappropriate use of, of individuals being placed in state mental institutions, for instance, and often, just being locked up for life. And so one of the, the things the law was looking at was to really end indefinite commitment. Um, it wanted to bring about a process for prompt evaluation and treatment. So when, when we talk about the CAT team, which I think is specific to Orange County, or if we talk about the access line and PMRT, those are the avenues through which individuals can be um, assessed and, and determined if they need treatment. The act was brought about to provide for individualized treatment, supervision and placement, and to safeguard an individual's rights. One of the things that's, that's, that's really a fundamental in the LPS law is that it did establish a due process for, which, for how somebody can be involuntarily detained. And I will be honest with you, that due process is not easy. I mean, to get to a conservatorship or to even get your loved ones hospitalized or detained and held on an involuntary hold is difficult. And to some extent, there was some intention around that with the law, that it wouldn't be the easiest thing in the world to place someone in, a, in an involuntary mental health setting or to conserve them. Um, but at the same time, I think that it, it has been become equally difficult to even get some of those basic services. Um, and I've seen a lot of that in the chat room, right? Just the challenge in getting your loved one into the hospital. And I'll talk a little bit about why I think that is as we move through the presentation. Um, other things that are important in the law is to provide services in the least restrictive setting. I will use that 
phrase frequently. Everything about um, conservatorship is, is, is that the person should be in the least restrictive setting to meet their needs. And um, then we have the, the, pol the procedures, all of the due process that's set up for involuntary treatment. And again, I'll talk a little bit more as we go through each slide. Next slide, please. What are the effects of conservatorship? So basically it's shifting the responsibility for making personal care and financial decisions from the client. The person doesn't get to make their own decisions anymore and that's gonna be moved to the conservator. It does impose significant constitutional or civil rights. Um, and so we often talk about conservatorship being the last resort because we are taking away what you and I all have those basic rights to make decisions. Who do I want? Where do I want to live? Do I need to take this medication? All of those basic decision making now has been taken away from the individual who's suffering from the mental health disorder and is giving that power to the conservator. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's very um, important and, and uh, to recognize the loss of an individual's rights. But that being said, sometimes LPS conservatorship in particular, it may be the best guarantee for actually protecting that person and their interests, um, at least for the short term. Next slide. Next slide. So I, I'm going to talk about um, the three ways we can get referrals in the public guardian's office right now. Um, I'm going to talk about our inpatient process. This is what we refer to as the traditional process and is probably, if you are not in L.A. County, this is probably the process that you have in your county in terms of how uh, conservatorships are done. So basically, uh, and I may be repeating a little bit of what's been said by Jim and, and Gail, but it's okay because I think this is really complex information and I think it's kind of good to, to hear it again. Uh, so the process for the traditional referral starts with the client being placed in a designated facility. So one of the acute psychiatric facilities in the county. Um, and this is usually done, this is done through the 5150, which is um, an individual is going to be uh, found to be a danger to themselves or danger to others or gravely disabled by either law enforcement or some other designated psychiatric um, professional. And the individual is going to be taken to the hospital. And then at the hospital, the hospital will make a decision whether or not the person should be admitted. I do want to make it very clear that the 5150 is the ability to take custody of the person and transport them to the hospital for further evaluation. There will be another evaluation at the hospital to determine whether or not your loved one will be admitted to the hospital on the 5150 and be held up to three days. It's not a guaranteed three days, it's up to three days, up to 72 hours. Um, if your loved one gets admitted to the hospital and is detained for the, for the 72 hours, and that um, the hospital determines that they, do, they cannot be released, um, they will then be placed on the 5250, which is an additional 14 day involuntary hold. As Gail said, within four days of that 5250, there will be a certification hearing. So in the hospital, the hospital has to prove to the, um, to the probable cause hearing officer, this is someone that's working on behalf of the court, um, to say that, this, that your loved one should remain in the hospital. Your loved one will have a patient's rights advocate who will um, be... Uh, arguing that your loved one be released from that hold. Um, and depending on the outcome of that case, your loved one will either be released or be continued to be held for the 14 day hold. In LA County, at the end of the 14 day hold, if, you're, if the, the individual cannot be released, uh, LA County can place the individual on an intensive 30 day intensive hold. I wanna point out that not all counties use this hold. So please be mindful of that. 
Um, and if there is no intensive hold and your county only has the 14 day hold, then the conservatorship would have to be um, established and the referral made to the public guardian's office and established before the end of that 14 day hold. In LA County, we're going to um, have that additional 30 day hold. The total amount of time in LA County that your loved one can be held is 47 days. That would also be the case if your loved one was placed on a TCON um, in another county prior to um, the expiration of the 14 day hold. For LA County, we're gonna receive referrals usually at the end of the 14 day hold or the beginning of the 30 day hold. And we do have some rules and regulations around when that referral has to come into our office. The hospitals are very familiar as to when they need to get that to us. Um, one thing to recognize is that if your loved one happens to be in a, in a hospital that's using the 30 day hold, and let's say they were doing pretty good, right? They were, the hospital decided to put them on the 30 day intensive and they weren't gonna refer to the public guardian's office because it looked like those 30 days of additional treatment would be sufficient to get them discharged um, to a, with an appropriate discharge plan. But if they, 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 don't do well toward the end of that 30 day hold, there is not going to be the opportunity to get a referral to the public guardian's office and for us to petition. So there are timelines and deadlines for when the hospital can get the referral to us. And they, if they get it to us too late, there is nothing that we can do because we have some legal timelines we have to follow in order to file a petition and to conduct an investigation. Next slide. So the inpatient um, conservatorships are for persons who have serious mental illnesses who require involuntary treatment. For this referral process, only designated doctors and facilities can initiate the LPS referral. And in LA County, we have over 40 designated facilities, including the jail. So this would be any of the acute um, psychiatric hospitals uh, that are in um, LA County can refer. We can also accept referrals from uh, uh, acute psychiatric uh, facilities outside of our county if your loved one who's a resident of LA County gets hospitalized in a surrounding county. Next slide. So I talked a little bit about this idea of certification hearings. Just wanting you to understand all of the legal processes that go along with um, involuntary treatment, the hold and the conservatorship. So there's gonna be a certification hearing within four days of the establishment of the 5250, the 14 day hold. There's also another certification hearing that takes place if your loved one is placed on the 30 day intensive. These are done in the hospital. Again, probable cause about whether or not your loved one remains a danger to them, to others, a danger to themselves or gravely disabled. The patient's representative um, and the hospital personnel are involved with this. There's another um, legal process called a Reese hearing. So just because your loved one has been 51 does not mean that they're automatically being given medications. So if the hospital determines that your loved one does in fact need involuntary medication, then the hospital has to petition the court for what's called a Reese hearing. This is the ability to involuntary med involuntarily medicate uh, an individual who's on a hold. I will note that in LA County, when public guardian establishes our temporary conservatorships, we do not get the power to medicate. So we would actually need to actually get a, a Reese hearing or a TCON Reese is what we call it, um, done in order to have medication done on the temporary conservatorship. Um, here we're looking at a, a, ba a legal basis of clear and convincing evidence that the person needs to take medication. If your loved one is at the hospital on the 5250 or that 30 day in intensive, that Reese hearing is gonna take place at the facility. If we have a temporary conservatorship in place and public guardian is the temporary conservator, that hearing will take place at the court. 
And then there is another option available for your loved ones. If they have lost their certification hearings and they're being continue to be held at the hospital, they can ask for what's called a writ of habeas corpus, often referred to as a writ. In this, they would have a hearing to ask the, the judge to release them from the involuntary hold. Just letting you know, there is a lot of legal, legal process um, in these involuntary treatment um, holds. Next slide. So uh, Gail and Jim both went over this um, in terms of the, the legal basis or the uh, criteria for conservatorship. So it's gravely disabled, I won't repeat that. But I, will want, I do want to make a comment around the chronic alcoholism. Just want to be very honest and open that generally we're not going to be uh, establishing a conservatorship solely based on chronic alcoholism. Usually alcoholism is a co-occurring disorder. We're going to look to, uh, we're conserving and accepting referrals for individuals who have primarily, have a primary serious mental health illness um, or disorder and um, alcoholism is probably a, a co-occurring. Um, we just do not have any treatment facilities that will, uh, particularly anything inpatient that will um, address chronic alcoholism as the sole or primary disorder. The other thing is that if the primary um, disorder is a substance use disorder that is not um, eligible for the conservatorships, uh, as Gail said, many of our clients come in with co-occurring disorders and substance use is a co-occurring, but it's not the primary issue. And if, if substance use is the primary issue, um, you're just not really going to be seeing involuntary treatment um, for an extended period of time. Um, your loved one might get 5150, they might stay in the hospital initially, but as soon as that substance use uh, clears up uh, and that frequently happens after a few days of not having access to the substances, then some of the psychosis that goes along with the substance use disorder may not be there and your loved one may not be continuing on the, on the hold. Um, and the other thing that's really important to recognize is that your loved one is unwilling or incapable of accepting voluntary treatment. Obviously, if they can accept voluntary treatment, um, they are not gravely disabled. Next slide. So a referrals come into the public guardian's office. We've accepted that referral. We're gonna send that referral over to our attorneys, which is called county council. And county council is going to petition the court to have public guardian appointed as the temporary conservator of the person only. There are no estate powers in the TCON. Um, and this is gonna be up to 30 days. I want you to know, not all petitions for TCONs are granted. The court has the discretion to deny our petition for TCON. So it's not an automatic. And we have in fact seen our TCON request be denied because there is insufficient evidence um, at that point to support the temporary conservatorship. So um, we're going to request it. We'll wait to make sure that the court has appointed us as temporary conservator. This will be no longer than 30 days. It's going to run parallel to that 30 day intensive hold that I talked about. Um, we're really looking at that 47 days is our, we have to um, act and do something within those 47 days of the involuntary hold. We will have a hearing before that 47th day regarding whether or not your loved one should be placed on a permanent conservatorship. While we are on the temporary conservatorship, I will have one of my deputies who's an investigator um, assigned to the case and they will do some of these things or all of these things, review the medical records, conduct a LexisNexis search so that we can find family in the event that the hospital doesn't know a family, um, consult with the treatment team, interview family, friends, and significant others, have a face-to-face -face interview with the proposed conservatee and submit a comprehensive court report. I will tell you, um, COVID has changed the way we do business. Um, so we're not generally allowed into the hospitals to conduct our face-to-face -face interviews, uh, which is how we used to do it pre-COVID. So right now we're um, 
trying our, our, our level best to do a video um, uh, interview with um, our proposed conservatees or our temporary conservatees. And if we cannot get the video, then we'll at least try to do the phone interview. Um, but it is a, a new world with COVID. So uh, we're trying to do our best. But right now, inpatient face-to-face -face contact is generally not allowed because most hospitals are um, closed for COVID precautions. Next um, slide. So I, I kind of told you about the process that happens with the traditional, um, and I now want to switch over to the um, outpatient. I'm going to highlight this a little bit, but I do want to say that Dr. Sharon intends to be on at four o'clock and does also want to talk about this pilot, um, and he may go in a little bit more in depth on some of these concepts. So we right now have two pilots in LA County that we're doing. The first one involves our Department of Mental Health directly operated clinics. So for those of you not familiar with the way Department of Mental Health operates, um, there are clinics, outpatient clinics, where DMH staff um, staff that. They have DMH psychiatrists and case managers and licensed clinical social workers. The DMH can also contract out to what we call legal entity providers or contractors that also can provide outpatient services. So I want to make it clear that this pilot is only for our directly operated clinics, DMH staff, DMH psychiatrists who are designated to provide um, referrals. I keep using that word designated. That's a key component of our of our law in that um, it there needs to be a designated professional person to refer to the public guardian's office. And so for LA County, those designated individuals are either in the acute psychiatric hospitals, the jail, or the DMH psychiatrists and personnel. Um, so the clinic needs to have contact with us first. We have a, a work group and a process that goes on and our clinics are familiar with this. We have presented this information to them. This is for individuals who are chronically gravely disabled, who've had repeated hospitalization, medication non-compliance, and the alternatives have been tried but have not been successful. So some of those things that Gail talked about, full service partnerships, assisted outpatient treatment, those are considered you know, alternatives and least restrictive um, options that should be tried before conservatorship is done. So we need to see some pattern of that or some history that those things have been tried prior to a referral coming to us in this pilot. Um, again, not available to our contractors. Um, and, and I wanna point out third party assistance has a huge impact on these referrals. Um, this is the concept that Gail talked about, that if someone is willing to provide food, clothing, or shelter to the proposed conservatee, and that proposed conservatee is willing to accept the, that assistance, they are not by law um, gravely disabled. This is a legal process. There's case law on this that says that a person cannot be gravely disabled if there's third party assistance. So sometimes what we see with our directly operated programs is that um, the, the client is actually living at home and um, they're, they're receiving their mental health services from the outpatient clinic. Um, and we're going to have to look at whether or not the third party assistance issue um, is going to affect our final decision. Um, again, uh, you know, this is a referral and an investigation. There is no guarantee that Public Guardian will actually petition on this. We do not establish temporary conservatorships in this pilot because the person is not in the, in the hospital. The temporary conservatorship gives us the authority to hold somebody in the hospital. Um, and, the, and these individuals are not going to be in the hospital. So we are not going to do a temporary conservatorship. We're just gonna, if we petition, we'll be going for a permanent um, he, uh, conservatorship. Um, and just a comment, cause I know we hear this a lot from our family members. Usually family, many family members want to conserve their loved one, not because there's a problem right now, but because they're concerned about a future problem. And that's really not the reason why we can conserve. Um, so we have to be able to 
prove to the court that the that the individual is currently gravely disabled and unable to provide for their food, clothing, and shelter due to their mental health disorder. We can't base it on future concerns or even the fact that you'd like the power to hospitalize them in the future. Uh, we have to prove current grave disability. And let me just also, um, and, and I'll probably talk about this again, but talk about let you know that you know we have to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt so that's the highest standard legal standard so we have a a, a huge hill to overcome in terms of proving these cases to to the court then our other pilot um, which is um, pretty new um, since July is um, our home team pilot. Um, so our home team is our um, homeless outreach um, and engagement team. And they're out there providing intensive outreach and engagement to the chronically homeless. And they can uh, refer to us if they see someone who is chronically uh, gravely disabled and is unable to survive safely in the community. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that concept because I know Dr. Sharon really wants to spend some time on his vision on uh, uh, inability to survive safely in the community. Uh, the other important thing is that um, the client is refusing all services. And again, everything's been tried. So the platter of services have been offered to the client. You know, FSP, housing, medications have been tried with this very intensive outreach and engagement on the streets. And, and the, the client has refused or it has not worked out. Very important to recognize that in both of these pilots, the goal is not to have the individual hospitalized. Our goal is to try and do this outside of the hospital um, uh, process. So it's not the traditional process. It's outside and done in the community. If we have to do an acute hospitalization, it's really going to be our goal is short term, really just to stabilize the person because they are, in fact, need an acute stabilization. We do not want to hospitalize just because they're gravely disabled. We want to hospitalize because they are acutely ill. Um, and placement. The goal is really placement in the community. So for both of these pilots, you are not generally going to see your loved one placed in an IMD. And uh, let me just answer that question because I think it was in the chat a couple of times. An IMD is an in the Institute for Mental Disease, and these are long-term locks, like psychiatric facilities. So in these pilots, we are not looking to, con to, to place people in the locked facilities. We are looking to place them in the community with um, support services such as FSP um, and hopefully maintain them at the lowest level of care, least restrictive environment that we can. Next um, slide. So uh, let me talk about the criteria for outpatient conservatorship. Um, uh, we still have the definition of gravely disabled, which is unable to provide for your food, clothing, or shelter due to a mental health disorder. But we do have this additional component that must be done by the psychiatrist. So the professional person or the, the designated person who is referring to us has to um, be able to say that they've examined and evaluated the person determine that the person is in fact gravely disabled and they have determined that a future examination on an inpatient basis is not necessary in order to determine if the person is, is gravely disabled. So basically what this is saying is this, the designated psychiatrist, and I'll talk about home team right now, has said, look, I believe they're, they meet criteria for grave disability and I do not need to actually put them in the acute hospital to make that determination. So we're getting that added piece of information in the referrals that come from um, both of our both of our pilots, the directly operated clinic pilot and for our home team. Next slide. Okay, so uh, the directly operated clinic or the home team is going to submit an application for LPS conservatorship, what we commonly call a referral. And again, the public guardian has the uh, ability to accept or reject that referral. I, I will tell you that um, 
we are having a lot of conversations around these cases before the referral is submitted. Because these are pilots, we have some work groups in place that will discuss the appropriateness of a case um, and determine if this is the right one to send, you know, to be referred to the public guardian to make sure that all of those um, alternatives have been tried. Everything's been exhausted before the referral comes to the public guardian. Because remember, conservatorship's a last resort, right? This is the last thing that we do, not the first thing that we do. So we want to see evidence that um, alternatives have been tried. So uh, a public guardian will investigate any accepted referral and our investigation is being done on the streets. So wherever the client is, in our home um, pilot, we're doing investigations with the home team on the streets. So my deputy is going out, meeting the client, wherever they live and, and engaging in them and conducting that interview on the streets. Um, if the, the directly operated referral, the clients living in the home of their family or their own apartment, we're going to meet them in that setting and we'll have the face-to-face -face and interview there. We are still doing face-to-face -face, um, contact in these types of settings. Anything outside of a hospital, we are making sure to engage in that face-to-face -face interview process. Um, and then for the home team, um, I did tell you for our directly operated referrals, we're not doing TCONs on those cases, but for the home team, there's the possibility of establishing the TCON, but the TCON is going to be used in some very uh, specific ways. Um, and I believe I have that on the next slide. So let's go to that next slide. So the TCON for our home team pilot is really about, do we need to get them off the streets um, and into a housing setting? And, and obviously that's our goal. They may not need to go to the hospital, but maybe we're gonna put them in a board and care or um, a crisis residential facility or some other So we might utilize the temporary conservatorship in that way. Um, the also the temporary conservatorship would also be able to help us in, um, you know, getting acute stabilization if we need that, doing medical clearance or um, maybe a detox because there those are some additional complexities that we have with our cases um, that are coming off the streets in particular that we need to address that and the temporary conservatorship could be used to facilitate um, managing these these critical issues that we need to do um, and then we might seek a TCON Reese for medication non-compliance uh, and in terms of testimony, um, I did answer the question I think earlier somebody posed around the family member being in court and generally we don't do that on our traditional referrals. We might, well, and not that we're going to necessarily use family in our home referrals, um, family might not be involved in some of these cases, uh, but you'll see that our testimony is going to look a little different. We're not just going to use the doctor and the client to testify. We might use some of the, the home team members members, the case managers, people who have been working with the client for months and months and months on the street, they may come in and testify. Um, we may use my deputy to come in and testify. Traditionally, my, test my deputies don't have to testify in court. They submit their court report, but they don't testify. But because this is so new and so different, and um, uh, even for the courts, this is so new, we are prepared to utilize a broader a number of individuals to help prove our case around grave disability. Um, and the other issue that this helps us deal with is there's a thing called the Sanchez rule. This is a rule about hearsay. So right now in our court hearings, an individual, a doctor, anyone cannot testify to something they read about in the medical chart. They can only testify to what they've directly observed or what they've directly direct conversations. So what this does is it helps us bring in all those people who have information, who can testify to their personal observations, um, and it helps it to get that information to the court and on the record. Next slide. So 
So in terms of our home team pilot, um, if the permanent conservatorships established, we're going to arrange placement, establish benefits, transfer the case to the ongoing case deputy. This is no different than a referral coming through on our traditional route through the, through the, the hospitals. Um, these are the, the, the common things that a conservator, the public guardian is going to do. If for some reason our conservatorship is denied, home team is going to stay involved with that client. Um, and so, and, and the same would be true for a directly operated. The client will still be served by the directly operated clinic. So there's not a drop off in no services that the teams will continue to serve the client. We just may not have a conservatorship in place and public guardian will no longer be involved with that client. Next slide. So again, I've, I've said this a couple of times, but uh, it uh, bears repeating. Conservatorship's a last resort. Because we take away the person's rights to make their own decisions, everything we take for granted, this should be the last thing that we do, not the first thing that we do. So we want to make sure that all sorts of alternatives have been tried. When we're looking at the home pilot, this is offering of services, we call it the platter of services, you know, medication, housing, shelter, you know, can we get you to the shelter? Can we get you into a motel? Um, you know, can you, will you start to take oral medication? Can we get you on a, a, a long-term acting injectable? Um, you know, will you accept an apartment, um, board and care? And, and really just having that intensive engagement. One of the key, very important things to point out about this home pilot, um, and I won't, I, I don't think I mentioned this, we are doing this pilot because the Board of Supervisors um, did a motion to direct us to do this. We were work, we had already started the, the clinic one, so this was a board motion to move forward in this direction. But one of the key components of this pilot is the Public Guardian's Office will not petition on a um, home pilot referral unless placement has been figured out. Uh, the last thing that we want is a conservatorship in place and the person still homeless on the street. So we do have to figure out the placement component before the petition is going to be filed. When we looked at the directly operated pilot, some of the um, alternatives that we're going to look to to see if those have been tried is the assisted outpatient treatment, full service partnerships uh, at the outpatient clinic and getting services or not, um, the wellness um, clinics that are available. So any of those um, um, outpatient services um, or less restrictive services have been tried and failed, um, and there is the need for the higher level of care. Next slide. Alternatives to conservatorship. So I told you that one of our responsibilities as the investigator is to determine whether or not um, a conservatorship should be established. And we have to look to see if there are alternatives, whether the ones I just talked about for our outpatient pilots or our traditional ones. And one of the main things to talk about um, and for families to understand is this idea of the, of the proposed conservatee putting forward a plan for self-care. Um, and and what, the, what the law looks at and what the court looks at is, is it reasonable or suitable? Um, and I, I think it's important for you all to understand that that um, interpretation of suitable is in the eye of the beholder sometimes and, and can be, um, you know, uh, there are certain circumstances where even when the public guardian is recommending conservatorship, the court or a jury do not agree that conservatorship is necessary because the conservatee can put forward uh, what the court fi finds to be a suitable alternative. And let me give you an example um, just to demonstrate this. We had a case actually come to us out of the jail uh, for an individual who had been chronically homeless. And um, that gentleman was not doing well and he was um, you know, had, did not have any insight, didn't really want to take any medication, had been in and out of the jail, in and out of the hospital. So we had a, a really good history that he had failed on, on, on alternatives. Um, and we recommended conservatorship. The psychiatrist did a fa fantastic job testifying at the court trial that he needed conservatorship. And the client got up to, to testify. And, 
I, to be honest, was pretty disorganized, had some trouble even, you know, stating his name. And, and, um, but when he was asked by the judge what his plan would be if he was released, he informed the court that his plan would be to return to his homeless encampment where he had a tent, um, that he could get at least two meals a day from homeless service providers in the area, um, and they could get him new clothes if he needed it. And then kind of bonus points, he informed the court that if he needed medication, he could go down to the hospital down the street and he could get medication. And, and so we were a bit surprised, but our, our judge came back with a ruling and said, you know, this may not be a plan that you and I would want for our loved ones, but it is a plan to provide for food, clothing, or shelter. And what I want to point out to you is that that is what we have to prove in court. Can the person provide for food, clothing, or shelter? Not is the person compliant with medications, not is the person, you know, refusing to accept that they have a mental health disorder. The, the issue before the court is, can they come up with a plan for providing food, clothing, and shelter? Um, and so um, sometimes that, not sometimes, many times, it's very difficult to get over that, that very narrowly focused um, issue that we have to prove to the court. And your loved one, after being in the hospital for 47 days, after receiving some treatment, may look very different to the court and to us on the 47th day than they looked on the fifth day of the hospitalization. And they might be able to, what we call, present well. And they might be very, they might present well enough to the court for that very short hearing that they look like they are going to be able to take care of their food, clothing, and shelter. They might tell the court, I'm willing to take my medication. I accept that I have a mental health disorder. And those things coming together may end up with a ruling by the court that the individual, that your loved one is not gravely disabled. So just recognizing um, some of the, the realities of, of the process. Third party assistance I've already talked about, voluntary. So your loved one saying that they're willing to accept treatment voluntarily makes them not gravely disabled. Anyone who would leave the state or get placed out of the state um, would not qualify for conservatorship. The conservatorship would not continue because um, it's only within the state. The powers exist within the state. And then just um, when we have a full conservatorship, just so you know, um, if the if the conservatee AWOLs, um, we're going to terminate that case usually after 60 days of them being missing. Now, we can change that on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but generally, once they've been missing for up to 60 days, we're going to terminate our conservatorship. Next slide. So I talked about this. Um, the, the, we have a requirement and the law requires that we prove our case beyond a reasonable doubt. This is the highest legal standing there is. It's the same standing that is used in the criminal court. Um, even though we're a civil proceeding, we have a few elements from the criminal court, specifically be, uh, proving our case beyond a reasonable doubt, um, that is a factor. That is sometimes challenging for it's difficult to overcome. So just recognize um, and, and to just, if you're not real familiar with the court process, that would be if you went to a jury, right? And same with the judge. If you had a jury trial, you know, and somebody had a doubt, then you would have to rule not gravely disabled. And we use that in our jury trial or our court trial. If the judge has a doubt, then she would come back and rule um, that the individual is not gravely disabled. Next slide. So uh, just a little bit about public guardian. Once we're appointed by the court to be conservator, uh, we're going to manage the daily life and or financial affairs of the conservatee due to the limitations and based on the power that the court gives us. Next slide. 
Uh, these are all the powers. I'm not going to go over them. You have the PowerPoint, but if you're appointed conservator, if public guardian is appointed conservator, these are some of the powers that you get. I will make a note that estate powers, um, generally when we recommend family to become conservator, we recommend you only to be conservator of the person only, and we ask that you become the representative payee for any public assistance benefits. In the event that there is an estate, most clients only have SSI and Medi-Cal, so there isn't an estate that needs to be managed. But if there is some issue, as Gail said, around you need to, to negotiate debts or do something around that, those powers can be added. You can ask the court to appoint an attorney to help you get those powers. But generally, you don't need estate powers, and you don't really want estate powers if you don't need them, because you have to do a lot of other things around the court. So uh, this gives you some of the ideas on the powers that you want to get. I will make some comments around medical consent authority. So the LPS law is about mental health. It's not about physical health. Um, in LA County, if your loved one at the time that we um, do the petition, if there is a chronic medical condition that needs non-intrusive medical care, so let's say your loved one has diabetes and they're taking oral medications to control that um, diabetic condition, we can ask the court for what's called power 12. Power 12 would give the public guardian or the private conservator authority over